Hello, my name is Meg Monday, and I'm the Director of Educational Programming at Cancer Connect. I want to thank you for joining us today for a live chat with Dr. Stephen Edge and Ms. Kathleen Fassel from Roswell Park Cancer Institute on managing lymphedema. We're very excited to have Dr. Edge and Ms. Fassel as today's experts. Dr. Edge is the Alfiero Foundation Endowed Chair in Breast Oncology, Medical Director of the Breast Center and Chief of Breast Surgery in the Department of Surgical Oncology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Ms. Fassel is the Co-Director of Lymphedema Management Services at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Dr. Edge is actively involved in clinical research and continues to lead innovative studies in breast cancer. And Ms. Fassel, a trained lymphedema specialist and a breast cancer survivor herself, manages many patients dealing with lymphedema through physical therapy. Today's program takes place in two parts. To begin, we'll hear from Dr. Edge and Ms. Fassel. During the program, you will have the opportunity to submit questions. Just type in your questions in the space provided below on the screen. Then after the presentation, Dr. Edge and Ms. Fassel will answer as many questions as possible in the time allotted. We appreciate your interest and participation. After the program is over, we'll host this program on our on-demand section here in the community so that you can visit it again or share it with others who may benefit. Thank you again for joining us, and I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Edge and Ms. Fassel. Good evening. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, what I would like to do today is to start out with a very, very basic lecture. Uh, we'll talk about the function of the lymphatic system, um, how you would develop lymphedema, and most important, how we manage lymphedema. Uh, the function of the lymphatic system, uh, there are three functions. The first one is the preservation of fluid balance, and we will be paying much attention to this particular function. The other important uh, part of the lymphatic system is the defense mechanism, that is your ability to fight infection. And the third that is probably the least known would be the nutritional component where you actually digest fats. Uh, on the one side of the picture, you can see that there are several lymph nodes in your body. Uh, most people know that you at least have glands, um, and those are your lymph nodes. When you say you have a sore throat and your lymph nodes are swollen, your glands are swollen, that's actually your lymph nodes trying to fight infection. That's very normal. That's exactly how it should happen. What most people don't know is that connecting to those lymphatics are lymphatic vessels. They help to drain fluid from the extremities, from the belly, from the head and neck area, um, even from the genital area. These particular lymphatic vessels actually run right alongside the veins of our body. So if, you know, as I said before, most people really do understand that there are lymph nodes, especially cancer patients, because you have very, you know, you're paying very close attention to the fact that you have lymph nodes in certain areas because your cancer could spread to those lymph nodes. What most people don't understand is that connecting to those lymph nodes are the channels that help to drain the arm. If you understand this particular picture, I think you will get a very good understanding of how lymphedema does develop. Um, this is a normal lymphatic scheme. On the left side of the picture is the lymphatic end organ. Um, then uh, the lymphatic uh, fluid actually drains through the lymphatic vessel, and then it travels to a lymph node where it's purified. Um, what happens in our normal circulation is that pouring from the veins of our body are fluids and proteins and waste products, and about 10% of our circulation actually ends up in what we call the interstitial space. So that's all the white area that is not labeled. And once the, the, the fluids, the proteins, uh, the water contents, some waste product actually build up, um, it actually opens up those lymphatic end organs. And uh, it's a kind of a lazy process. So when the proteins build up, those lymphatic end organs open up. There are little gates. There are little uh, filaments. They're called filaments of leak. Um, then 
the fluid ends up um, in that big uh, hair-shaped area, when that particular um, organ becomes filled, it then pushes into the next level. And that those heart-like shaped areas, um, there are some valves within that area that just open up. So it just fills and empties, fills and empties. It then flows into the lymph nodes and eventually that fluid ends up back in the veins of our body. So if you have your lymph nodes removed, if you have a few lymph nodes removed, you do not have all of those lymphatic channels working. So some of that fluid can actually end up in the interstitial space. And that's exactly what lymphedema is. It is the pooling of those fluids outside those end organs. It doesn't end up back into those uh, uh, lymphatic areas. So what influences the lymphatic system? Well, if we remember the slide before, remember that there were some valves. Um, so perhaps in the early stages of lymphedema, if you tip your arm upside down and you let gravity work for you, you can actually influence those valves. Um, around those heart-shaped vessels, and I'll just go back to that, um, around that very stringy area where you see those heart-shaped vessels, there are smooth muscles. Um, so if you actually put those muscles on a bit of a stretch, um, maybe by compressing very, very softly, you can actually speed the, the, uh, speed the fluid going through that area. Um, because the lymphatics are not powered by the heart, uh, you can, if you contract your muscles, you can actually also influence that, uh, that system just by contracting the muscles around that vessel. Um, they say also that if you increase the pressure around the tissues uh, by applying some type of pressure, either with a sleeve or with bandages, you actually can prevent some of the fluids from escaping from the veins in the first place. Also, if you increase the intrathoracic pressure, um, that means if you maybe even work your diaphragm, you press down on a very big lymphatic. Uh, it's called the cisterna chyli. So there are several ways that we can actually influence a healthy and a non-healthy lymphatic system. So one would be, you know, tipping your arm upside down, getting your extremity higher than the heart level. If we uh, stretch those muscles, uh, those smooth muscles, uh, we can influence it. If we contract our muscles around that particular organ, uh, if we compress the tissues, and also if you try to do some like deep breathing exercises, that might influence the lymphatic system. So who is at risk for developing lymphedema? Um, if you've had your lymph nodes removed, um, they not only, you know, after they remove those lymph nodes, those lymphatic channels um, don't hook up to those lymph nodes, so you have less channels working uh, to remove the fluid from around that interstitial space. Radiation can cause a hardening or a thickening of the skin, so if those vessels, which are almost spaghetti-like structures, they're very, very thin, um, can be damaged by radiation therapy, and also, if you have a tumor, um, that can also disrupt the lymphatic pathway. So if you have a large tumor, it can also prevent that fluid from flowing back um, into the necessary areas. So what are the distinguishing characteristics of lymphedema? Um, there is a concentration of plasma proteins in the extracellular spaces, and that's the troublesome element of this edema. It's very different than an athletic injury. You know, if you sprain your ankle, you actually have a swelling. It doesn't usually pit, but lymphedema is very, uh, uh, it's a little bit more dense. It tends to pit, so that means if you press it, it kind of leaves an imprint, and that's because there are plasma proteins um, in that extracellular space. 
Now this protein is very troublesome because it actually can cause some chronic inflammation. Uh, you can have a proliferation of fibrotic tissue so the skin becomes harder. Um, you can have enlarged fat cells um, and it is a very hospitable environment for bacterial or fungal infection. Um, this uh, accumulation of fluid actually is a good environment for us developing um, infections. So patients tend to get something that's called cellulitis, which is a localized skin infection and lymphangitis. What are the symptoms of lymphedema? Um, we talked about the fact that it is a, a swelling, an edema. It can be pitting and very firm. So as I just said, pitting means that if you kind of stick your finger into the swelling, it will leave an imprint. And over time, sometimes it could become even firmer than, than that, and it does not leave an imprint. There can be sensory changes. You can have a loss of normal sensation. Um, you can have pain. And it's not usually a sharp, stabbing pain, but it's very much like an arthritic, dull, aching pain that our patients describe to us. So it is uncomfortable. They describe feelings of heaviness. Um, I have actually seen some patients who have developed carpal tunnel or tarsal tunnel just because the swelling has pressed on the sensory nerve. Definitely loss of function. Um, if your arm or leg um, are large, um, you ha might have a hard time moving it in all directions. Um, patients who have lower extremity lymphedema might have a hard time stair climbing, getting off of a chair, bringing their leg into bed with them because the leg is so big. There are several skin changes that you can see with lymphedema. We all, you know, we did talk about the fact that you um, are at risk for developing cellulitis. Sometimes the uh, fluid actually weeps through the skin. Um, that's called lymphorrhea. Um, you can get uh, skin changes to where you have like a reddened appearance appearance to your skin. It can be like an erythema, or you can have a brawny or brown skin change. Uh, sometimes the skin is even almost marbleized. You can have uh, almost like a warty-like appearance if the edema um, goes through uh, different stages. Um, these are usually the end stages of lymphedema. Um, you can certainly have a loss of mobility and independence. Um, and I think the last one I think is um, you know, just very real to any patient who has uh, swelling. Um, if you have swelling in your arm, um, you might want to hide that arm. You don't wear the short sleeve shirts, the tank tops in the summer. Uh, you know, maybe you wouldn't want to go to the beach with a bathing suit if you have um, a, a lower extremity lymphedema. It becomes like an ugly, useless limb. Um, I can't minimize the psychological um, implications of developing lymphedema. It, it is very unfair. Um, as a breast cancer survivor myself, I only had a sentinel lymph node biopsy, but I, I personally would not like getting lymphedema. It is a constant reminder that, you know, you had breast cancer. And um, I, when I first diagnosed lymphedema, it's often a very... Um, tearful session um, you know, to say to a breast cancer patient, well, yes, you know, we saved your life, and you're free of your cancer, um, that's great, but to be left with uh, swelling is very unfair. Um, we do stage lymphedema in, in treatment. Um, stage one means that there is an accumulation of protein-rich fluid, there is pitting, it reduces with elevation, and there is no fibrosis. We would love to see all of our patients in stage one. It's very treatable. Um, there are occasions when we can actually reverse lymphedema. Most of the time, we cannot. But we would love to see most of our patients at the early stage. Stage two means that there's an accumulation of protein-rich fluid. Pitting becomes more difficult to elicit there is some evidence of fibrosis, so the skin becomes harder, um, pitting becomes more difficult. Uh, we still can treat in this particular stage. Stage three is the accumulation of protein-rich fluid. 
non-pitting, there's fibrosis, there's sclerosis, there's skin changes. Uh, sometimes you see skin folding on itself. Um, we, well, this is the, the last uh, stage of lymphedema. However, I would also say that we can treat lymphedema in any one of these stages. It is never, ever too late uh, to make a change in someone's life. So this is the nuts and bolts of why we're here tonight, because we're talking about how we manage lymphedema, and lymphedema can be effectively managed and controlled, usually not cured, but the course of treatment is called complete decongestive therapy, and I will go through every component of that in the next slide. And I have to say that the most important part of this is the self-maintenance regime. Um, this is when the patient takes on the responsibility of controlling their lymphedema. Um, it is a tough program to follow, I would have to say, because patients um, need to do certain things like exercise and apply bandages and apply uh, sleeves. And there are many people who we tell them that this is the correct treatment, and some of our patients do fall off the wagon. And that is understandable. Um, if you were coming into my Roswell Clinic, um, you certainly would have an evaluation by a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. The way that we evaluate to see the extent of the lymphedema is by doing volumetric measurements. We start at the base of the thumb. We look at the, um, the, the crease of the wrist, and then we measure every four centimeters and take circumferential measurements of the good side and also um, of the involved side. We plug those measurements into a computer and we get a computer readout and it will show us the amount of lymphedema that you have and the percent larger the lymphedema limb is relative to the normal limb. Uh, we do not have a, a parameter. This is a optoelectric machine. Um, there is like a large square that is drawn over a patient's extremity, um, and it is a very reliable method of measuring the volume, um, and it's, it, it's not painful. Um, it's just a light that's passed over, and it has a nice computer readout. Um, you will see a lot of this particular measurement in any facility that is doing research because it is a very exact um, measure of lymphedema. Um, it started out um, in facilities where they were just measuring for stockings and sleeves, um, but it has, uh, you will again see it in a lot of the research articles. A tonometer is a way of measuring a tissue density. It's a, a little device that you just press on the skin and it'll give you a readout. Um, the edema characteristics is something that I just map out um, very often. Um, there is something that is called a stemmer sign, and you can see it in the hand, and you can see it in the foot. In the hand, I would just pinch the skin on the top of one of the fingers, and if I can't grab it, it's a positive stemmer sign, because normally if you pinch your own finger, the skin returns back to the normal. In the foot, you usually uh, character, uh, characterize a stemmer sign by somebody who has a skin fold um, between the toe and the dorsum of the foot or the top of the foot. Um, edema characteristics, I'm looking for the skin's pitting ability. I map out the boundaries of where it pits, where it stops pitting, um, if there are any fibrotic changes. Um, any open areas in the skin, um, any recent um, manifestations of cellulitis that a patient may have had, um, looking at the color, looking at the temperature, um, you know, anything that's different than the other side. Uh, then bioimpedance is something that's um, becoming very popular. It is passing an electrical current uh, through the skin. Um, and mapping out how much resistance there is to the flow. And if you think about, you know, an extremity that actually has fluid in it, 
you would actually have less resistance in an area that has more fluid. So um, it is becoming a very important part of mapping out uh, swelling uh, that is not even clinically evident. Um, it's a good way to get what we call subclinical lymphedema and maybe you'd be able to start earlier treatment based on this particular tool. The evaluation tools that we also use, uh, any good therapist would also take a good manual muscle test, um, see what your range of motion is like, see how you're able to move, look at your sensory status, and also um, ask you if you have any pain. Uh, treatment, uh, we teach a lot about skin care. Uh, we will also talk about a massage called manual lymphatic drainage massage, compression bandaging, compression stockings, and also exercise. Why is skin care important? You definitely want to prevent an infection because infection can cause swelling, and we know that what the function of the lymph lymphatic system is to remove fluids. So if you already are compromised and if you have swelling, you may have a harder time getting rid of the fluid. So that's why we very much emphasize the importance of meticulous skin care. We can also um, you know, help maybe to reduce any chance of infection by taking extra good care of your skin. Uh, the gold standard of treatment at this particular time is still something that's called manual lymphatic drainage massage. It is a very comfortable, very light touch massage because remember that we talked about the fact that the lymphatic vessels are spaghetti-like in structure. They are very, very thin. You don't want to press too hard because you actually want to enhance fluid rather than stop the flow of fluid. Um, I think of manual lymphatic drainage massage as a massage that's done in three parts. And the first slide on the left shows somebody uh, who's getting the massage. And the first thing that we do is we work in the healthy lymphatics of the body. So we might be working in the neck we might be actually working across the chest or actually in the healthy lymphatics on the other side. So we have to clear the fluid first before we get to massaging the affected extremity. We then massage down the arm then back up the arm and eventually we do the third part of the massage as we try to direct the fluid to another area that we know works. So the first part is clearing the healthy lymphatics. The second is working on the arm. And we're trying to affect those smooth muscles around the lymphatics. And then we push the fluid um, again to another pathway. Um, I think this is a, a, a tough part of um, receiving this particular treatment because we then bandage the arm or the leg with short stretch compression bandages. And you can see with the arm on the left that the fingers are bandaged. Uh, there is a soft cottony material. There is then a very fluffy material to prevent the bandages from digging, digging into the skin. And we do what's called multi-layer compression bandaging. So there's more layers on the bottom than there is on the top. Our patients wear these bandages 23 hours a day. So they get the massage, which is about 40 minutes long, 40, 45 minutes. Then they leave with this bandage on and they come back the next day so that we can see what we've done in terms of compression. Sometimes we have to modify the bandage. We try to shape the arm or the leg into a cone. And sometimes we have to put different pieces of foam um, so that we get a conical shape. There are also lymphedema specific exercises that we do with our patients and again they are in a sequence. Um, we are going because uh, we talked about the fact that the lymphatics are influenced by the muscles around them. We actually work um, some of those areas uh, by working the muscles around the lymphatics. In our maintenance program 
um, I think here is the tough part. We know that we can get the patient's arm or leg down. And in fact, most of the patients that we deal with, we get between a 60 to 80% reduction in swelling. So we know that we can do it. But here comes the maintenance part. We then, once we get the arm down or the leg down, we fit for compression garments. And very often it will also include um, a gauntlet or a glove for the upper extremity. So our patients wear those sleeves or stockings um, throughout the entire day. We also show our patients how to self-bandage. So the diagram that you just saw of that multi-layer bandage application is something that we teach all of our patients to do. They wear the sleeve during the day or the stocking and bandage every night. Uh, we also reinforce the importance of skin care and nail care and show them the remedial exercises so they can do the exercises daily. So you can see that if you are a lymphedema patient that you, know, you can go to a trained therapist for this particular type of massage. Uh, the massage is wonderful. It's a face-to-face -face massage. It's light touch. You can talk during it. It doesn't hurt. But after this whole pleasant experience is done, there's a lot that you have to do on your own. And don't ever be afraid to tell your lymphedema therapist that you have fallen off the wagon. Because honestly, wearing compression sleeve during the day and self-bandaging at night is a lot to ask anyone to do. I personally don't know how compliant I could be with my own program. Some of the contraindications for treatment is if you have an active bacterial or viral infection, you need to be placed on an antibiotic. And we don't usually start treatment until you are on that antibiotic for at least five to seven days. If you have congestive heart failure, um, obviously this is an overall swelling of the extremities. Um, you wouldn't want to overburden um, your already poorly functioning heart with our treatment. If your kidneys aren't malfunction, are malfunctioning, um, obviously what we hope to do as lymphedema therapists is push all of that fluid into the kidneys and into the toilet. So if your kidneys aren't working, you're not going to be able to get rid of that fluid. And if you have an untreated malignancy, probably should get treatment before you uh, sign up for treatment. However, if you are in the end stage of breast cancer and wish to be treated, we never uh, turn anyone away because sometimes just bandaging uh, someone who has a very swollen arm can be a quality of life issue. So this is, I think, the most exciting component of the lymphedema treatment. So what's new in lymphedema? And I noticed there are a lot of questions talking about what is new. Um, we know that we have a treatment that works, but we also know people are falling off the wagon, so there are hopefully other treatments on the frontier. Um, some therapists are using low-level laser therapy, um, and they are trying to break down some of the fibrotic tissue. I understand that there is a clinical trial using this laser therapy, so we have yet to know the effectiveness, but uh, I think they are so far getting fairly good results. Surgical management, I am hoping in the near future that um, some of the uh, new surgical techniques or some of the old sur surgical techniques will uh, be the answer to uh, lymphedema management. And some of them uh, could be that they are now uh, anastomosing uh, the lymphatic and the venous system and getting good results. There was a physician in Italy, Dr. Uh, Capizzi, I believe, who was doing this work and has been doing it for a long time. Um, I mispronounced that as Camprizi, um, but he is professing to get good results. Uh, there's also a lot of talk about lymphatic transfer. So say if you had lymphedema in the uh, arm, they would actually take lymph nodes, vascular 
vascularize lymph nodes from the groin and implanting those into the um, into the axilla. And people are saying that they are getting some results with this. Um, not enough studies have been done to say whether it's more effective than what we are doing now. But you know, I, God, I hope that this could be the the, in the new frontier. Um, also, um, you know, lymphangiogenesis, um, making new lymph nodes. Um, there is a physician um, out of Stanford who is actually doing work with this particular phenomenon, and I'm hoping that um, this is going to be the new frontier. Um, one thing you have to be careful of when you do this is not to incur any new cancer growth. Um, and we also know that exercise used to be taboo. When I first started in this business several years ago that we used to say to our patients, do not do any repetitive resistive exercises. That this is harmful. We have completely um, disregarded this. Patients are asked to exercise. It's a good way to prevent um, your breast cancer from reoccurring. Um, there are studies to show that it actually decreases your lymphedema and certainly your whole self-esteem is improved with exercise. How can lymph edema be prevented? Um, you know, new improved surgical techniques. Um, now they're doing more sentinel lymph nodes than they, you know, they had been in the past. Try to prevent infection, taking good care of your skin, moisturize, common sense approach. If you have a cut, clean it. Put a little neosporin on it, cover it. Just common sense approach. Exercise exercise and exercise. Uh, also weight management. You know, people who are overweight uh, have a higher incidence of lymphedema. So what else can I do? Um, you know, in the early stages of lymphedema, definitely you can elevate higher than the heart level because you can influence those valves. Keep your skin clean, dry, or, I'm sorry, uh, clean and moist. Uh, avoid injury or infection of the arm, avoid tight clothing, do the prescribed exercises regularly uh, that are prescribed by your doctor or therapist, and avoid pressure. Don't cross your legs when sitting, don't carry a heavy handbag on an arm that's swollen, wear loose clo clothing, um, don't have a blood pressure taken on the affected side. It's not to say that if you have one blood pressure taken on an affected side that that's going to cause lymphedema but just be cautious and offer the other side and don't sit in one position for more than 30 minutes. Um, a great resource is the National Lymphedema Network. It's, it's wonderful. It has all the listing of uh, physical therapists that are occupational therapists or nurses who are doing the lymphatic treatment. Great resource. Um, you can talk to people online who have lymphedema. Some of the latest research will be projected um, with this wonderful organization. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Edge. So um, I'd also like to welcome everybody to the call. Uh, that was a wonderful overview, and I'd just like to uh, stress a couple of points that you made. Uh, the first is that, um, thankfully, we are seeing many fewer women with breast cancer having significant lymphedema um, because of the widespread use of sentinel lymph node biopsy. That said, um, we still unfortunately see many women with breast cancer and of course many with uh, other types of lymph node surgery having lymphedema. Even those women who have sentinel lymph node biopsy alone are at risk for getting at least mild lymphedema. Though many surgeons will say they never seen lymphedema after sentinel node biopsy, all of the large clinical studies of sentinel node biopsy in breast cancers were where arm swelling was specifically and objectively assessed, demonstrated that as many as 5 to 7% of women had at least some very mild lymphedema, even with sentinel lymph node biopsy alone. So um, taking care of the skin and taking appropriate precautions pertains to women who have sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, alone. Uh, uh, we are all also very enthusiastic about the potential for the lymph node transfer techniques uh, to be a major uh, step forward for women with significant lymphedema. Uh, I, I would stress that 
Uh, there are a number of uh, groups in the United States that have begun uh, doing this technique. Um, uh, women who are seeking this out have to be very careful to, uh, be, uh, to make sure that the surgeon to whom they're talking is part of a group that manages lymphedema and not just an independent surgeon doing this one surgical procedure that they have specific expertise in microvascular surgery and have gained uh, specialized training in this technique and are part of um, ongoing prospective um, evaluation of the effectiveness of this technique. Um, uh, as the technique is uh, becoming better known, it is proliferating around the country and I think um, uh, the buyer beware is important in seeking this out before one subjects themselves to this major surgical procedure, one that of course we are very hopeful will be a real answer for women with more significant lymphedema. So again, uh, thank you very much for a great overview and we look forward to some of the questions. Okay, um, number one, I am 25 years old, I'm sorry, I'm 25 years out from a modified radical mastectomy. What are the chances of developing lymphedema at this point? I was told by a lymphedema specialist that it can occur at any time. What is your take on this? Now, I think I can answer this, Dr. Edge, and I think you can also answer this. I said, sure. We yeah. have sure. in our clinic um, just a week ago, we saw somebody who was 30 years out. Um, she was a 92 year old woman who had a fall, and she had a radical mastectomy, had been lymphedema free for 30 years, and developed a you know traumatic experience, a fall and she had very profound lymphedema and we have seen patients who 25 or 30 years after having their surgery have developed lymphedema. It could be because of an, an infection or it could be I'd say lymphedema just waiting to happen that you know that the the burden of the lymphatics has been there all along and it, the system just breaks down so you always need to be cautious um, no matter how far you are, are out from having your surgery. I think those are really important points that uh, uh, I think to reassure the, 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 uh, the woman who asked this question is thankfully uh, if you're 25 years out most likely you won't develop lymphedema. Most women who are that far out who haven't developed it won't but you are still at risk and need to take appropriate precautions. Yes, I agree. Um, this is an interesting question. Is lymphedema a hereditary thing. My oldest son passed away from melanoma and lymphedema and I'd like to break this up into two parts. Yes, you can have lymphedema um, that is hereditary. There is a specific type of uh, cancer of lymphedema called Milroy's that you have a, a genetic predispos predisposition for this particular problem. However, the next statement, it seems to me that this woman is semi-fearful. Um, her son had melanoma and lymphedema. Now this would have been a secondary lymphedema probably caused uh, from uh, the melanoma surgery that they probably did some lymph node dissection so that is the reason that he developed lymphedema. So I don't think she has to be fearful but yes there are uh, certain lymphedemas that are genetically predis uh, predisposed but this particular unfortunate um, fellow had uh, lymphedema from the removal of lymph nodes. Um, is weightlifting safe? Uh, great question. I would have to say that if you are going to begin a weightlifting program that you start out very slowly and cautiously. Uh, you could actually start out just by moving your limb against gravity because your limb actually weighs a little bit and once you have full range of motion, pain free, unrestricted motion, then you can begin weightlifting. Start out with a few pounds and gradually progress. Just monitor for signs of lymphedema after you have worked out. Um, look at the top of your hand. Make sure that you can appreciate your blood vessels and tendons at the top of your hand turn your hand over and look at the blood vessels and tendons that are uh, the um, lower part of the arm. Just kind of give your arm a little squeeze and make sure that there is no swelling. But I would definitely encourage patients to go back to a very full and active weightlifting program. 
I myself lift weights. I do Pilates and I also do free weights and I work out very vigorously on machines but I didn't start out that way. I started out with a personal trainer um, even though I'm a physical therapist I didn't know all the function of all the machines so I did it very cautiously and so far so good. Kathy I think this is really important that people need to know that there has been a complete shift in our understanding of this over the last uh, 10 to 12 years with good strong clinical research data demonstrating that far from being harmful that progressive exercise including progressive weightlifting uh, may help prevent lymphedema far from causing it may actually help prevent it so we certainly encourage women to be active the old adage that a woman cannot lift more than 10 pounds is simply not true and in fact who can go through life restricting their their, their um, uh, lifting to only 10 pounds so uh, obviously no one can predict who will get lymphedema but uh, and and people should use common sense but uh, I think this has been a major shift in our understanding uh, uh, of this there's a question that just came in what is the best type of doctor example vascular podiatrist internist for a patient to see for follow-up besides the physical therapist? I'll let you answer this one, Dr. Hedge. I think the, the best doctor to see is one who is uh, involved in a comprehensive lymphedema treatment program. Rather than seeing an individual uh, vascular surgeon or individual breast doctor or an individual physio uh, physical medicine physician, uh, your, your best bet is to identify a comprehensive lymphedema treatment program in, in, in some medical center near your home and be involved with the physician who is part of that group. I'm fairly knowledgeable about this issue, but I'd be nowhere if I didn't have my close collaborations with my other team members, particularly Ms. Fassel and her team. So I would recommend that you find a comprehensive physical therapy and lymphedema treatment management program and work with a physician that involves that. This is especially true for an individual who has already developed lymphedema. Um, I have a question here. Um, what is the current treatment for lymphedema? And I think we've answered that question. Um, I wear a compression stocking and use a compression machine. It looks like my legs have not been reduced in size. Will they always be swollen? And I think the, the uh, missing component in this statement is the fact that a patient is just using a pump. Now, we used to use um, pumps, uh, lymph presses, Job's compression pumps years ago, and I, and I know that there are several out on the market that are more sophisticated than the ones we used to use, but I think um, this patient needs to go to a lymphedema center. Um, it sounds like she has not been bandaging her legs. Uh, she has not received the manual lymphatic drainage massage. Um, and I really don't believe that just using a compression device that would be, uh, that, that it will cause any reduction in her swelling. I would definitely have her seek out more comprehensive treatment uh, like the ones that we have described. Um, let's see. Oh, another frustrated patient um, did call in. We have done everything. Uh, I've done everything my physical therapist to do to get me under control, but to no avail. I cannot get out of. Uh, I cannot get out of my garment for more than an hour without it swelling up. I have been in a hospital for cellulitis. I'm an 11 year survivor. And I've been dealing with this for 10 and a half years since I started my radiation treatment. I'm at my wit's end as to what we can do now. Please help. Um, and I would have to say that uh, maybe this particular individual should go back to her physician and make the physician aware of the fact that what she's doing is not working. I would hope that there would be nothing else seriously wrong with this patient. Um, it looks like she's, uh, if she's gone to a therapist, I'm assuming that the therapist has been doing everything that she knows how to do. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, therapists are different in their approaches sometimes. Um, 
we have actually gotten some patients at Roswell who other therapists have treated. We do things just a little bit different than they do. Um, so maybe this patient can also seek out another lymphedema specialist in her area. Um, a good lymphedema therapist would uh, take this as an opportunity to learn from another therapist. Um, so I would recommend that maybe first the patient discusses her condition with her physician, and second, maybe she seek another uh, physical therapist who is trained in treatment. And Kathy, once again, I would um, urge uh, this person, if she is not already going through a comprehensive treatment program, which is coordinated between physicians and, uh, and uh, therapists, to uh, seek out such a program. If she's had such difficulty over this period of time, it may even be worth travel quite some distance to get opinions and uh, recommendations from uh, a leading lymphedema treatment center. And the lymphedema uh, network and uh, website and publications can help identify those centers around the United States. Another question, does the experience of the surgeon impact whether or not you will get lymphedema? Again, I think I'm going to direct this to you, Dr. Edge. Uh, the answer is to some extent yes. Um, there have been, uh, in, in, very over the last 25 years, an increased understanding of the extent of, of lymph node surgery and how to preserve the uh, fatty planes directly investing the uh, blood vessels so that those are not all stripped free of lymphatic material. So to some extent, yes, but unfortunately to some extent, no. The uh, experience of the surgeon will not prevent lymphedema. Anyone who, for appropriate medical reasons, requires a complete lymph node dissection is at significant risk of developing lymphedema. Um, but despite the, the best surgeon, um, any, any surgeon, honestly, who says that they never get lymphedema uh, simply isn't following their patients because uh, some of their patients will develop lymphedema. So while there are some techniques to help them minimize this, uh, unfortunately, they, uh, uh, they are surgeon in those many of those factors are surgeon independent. Um, one, one, one point that is clear, however, and that is uh, the surgeon should be fully aware of the times when lymph node dissection is warranted and when lymph node dissection is not warranted. Um, the, symptom, the advent of symptomal lymph node biopsy in the early 19, in the early uh, in the late 1990s and early part of the last decade uh, clearly changed the whole specter of lymphedema uh, when you look at the population of all breast cancer patients. Uh, and just in the last two years, there has been a major advance in our understanding of whether women who have positive lymph nodes with breast cancer require lymph node dissection. Uh, and in fact, those women with limited lymph node involvement do no longer require lymph node dissection. So it's very important that the surgeon not only be highly skilled, but be highly knowledgeable in the, um, uh, in the most, important, in the most uh, significant advances that have been made in this field. Uh, similarly, a melanoma surgeon or a surgeon that addresses lymph nodes in the lower extremities need to be fully versed uh, and only perform lymph node dissection when it is clearly medically indicated. Uh, here's another question. I am an ovarian cancer survivor and have lymphedema in my feet and ankles. Not much is discussed on this area. Um, I apologize. I think sometimes we tend to uh, talk too much about the breast cancer survivor. Yeah. But I have to say that as an ovarian cancer survivor, um, you probably have had some lymph nodes removed in the groin. So you are definitely at risk for developing lymphedema. And it sounds like you have a bit of lymphedema in your feet and ankles. Um, lymphedema is lymphedema. Um, it can be treated. And I, again, would encourage you to seek out a lymphedema therapist in your area. It might be that if your lymphedema is just, you know, very manageable, um, if it reduces after elevation, you might just profit from wearing just a compression stocking. But you also have to know somebody that can fit for good compression stockings because a bad stocking can actually make things worse. But I would say go in, get an evaluation, make sure that they take measurements, talk to you about treatment, uh, possibly do some manual lymphatic drainage massage, compression bandaging and get a good stocking. And I do apologize. Sometimes we tend to over Kathy, as the breast something cancer. has struck me about this question, uh, and that is 
Um, in ovarian cancer, lymph node dissection may or may not be used done as extensively, certainly not necessarily in the groin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly, we don't know this, this patient, and I haven't seen her, but uh, women who have swelling in their feet and ankles may not have lymphedema, they have, may have been a stasis disease, um, um, as to uh, many people. And so this is another area where it's important to consult with your physician and your uh, therapist about uh, the true the true nature of the swelling that you have to uh, address it appropriately. So not all swelling in the feet and ankles are due to lymphedema. And I would just caution the patient to be sure that those areas have been explored. Sure. That's where, you know, having a surgical report is very important, you know, understanding exactly what they did during surgery because actually, Dr. Edge, I'm also reading into it because it sounds like she almost has bilateral swelling and sometimes they just um, sample nodes on one side. So that is a very good point. She might just have venous stasis, um, but having said that, um, a good pair of compression stockings would probably serve her well. Absolutely. I, I have venous stasis disease myself, uh, and uh, where, particularly when I'm doing surgery, I would certainly wear support stockings all the time. You make your legs feel better. Uh, since returning to work, um, I've had an increase in lymphedema uh, measured at between three quarters and an inch and a quarter. Um, how bad is bad? Can it get worse? And I have a PT evaluation soon. So um, one way that we actually um, decide whether patients are getting uh, a comprehensive treatment is if it, if it is a two centimeter difference. And it sounds like this woman might fall into that category. So it's not the worst, but I would definitely say that going to her physical therapy evaluation is very, very important. Um, can lymphedema sometimes stay exactly the way it is at that particular time? I have patients who have had a little bit of lymphedema and have chosen not to treat their lymphedema and it has not changed over years. And I know that because they are nurses um, that I know very well here and so I can monitor them just by you know, looking at their extremity. But you always run the risk if you do not treat the lymphedema, it could get bigger, it could get harder, and you could be more susceptible to infections like cellulitis. So it's always better to treat early, um, but it's never too late to treat lymphedema if you decide not to seek treatment. Um, but definitely get in to see your physical therapist. She'll be able to take good measurements, uh, show you how to monitor, and show you a lot of tricks to treat your lymphedema. Uh, there's another question. Do the number of lymph nodes removed affect the lymphedema incidence? And I'll again let you handle this, Dr. Edge. Um, I think I know the Say that again. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, does the number of lymph nodes removed affect the lymphedema incidence? Well, certainly the extent of lymph node surgery affects the lymph node incidence so that um, uh, um, if one has a sentinel node biopsy, the risk is lower. If one has an anatomic dissection that constitutes a full axillary lymph node dissection, um, then the risk of lymphedema is higher. The exact number of lymph nodes may or may not be directly related to the risk of lymphedema because the number of lymph nodes varies widely among individuals. But uh, we generally do lymph node surgery based on anatomic boundaries. So a large vein um, marks the upper limit, the, the um, chest wall. This is in the case of lymph node surgery for breast cancer. The rib cage marks another, um, a muscle behind at the lower, the latissimus muscle. Um, at the back side, uh, and we take the fatty tissue that contains the lymph nodes. So the exact lymph node lymph nodes may not, but the extent of the lymph nodes are. And the surgical node, as uh, Kathy outlined earlier, um, can tell you what extent of lymph node surgery uh, was done. I'm going to extend the question a little bit uh, because uh, the other factor that will contribute to the risk of lymphedema is when full lymph node dissection is combined with with radiation treatments, both in breast cancer and other diseases that require lymph node dissection, um, uh, radiation treatments to the area may be necessary to reduce the an otherwise high chance of uh, reoccurrence of cancer in the additional lymph nodes that extend beyond the area of the lymph node dissection, so, so that uh, radiation is also given, and the combination of the two may increase the risk of lymphedema. Do we have time for one more question? 
okay, how does one deal with the psychological impact that primary lymphedema has not, that primary lymphedema of the lower limb causes? And well, this is a, a good question because I'd have to say, you know, primary lymphedema is one where you could be born with it. Not a lot of people understand what lymphedema is. Um, but there are, if you turn your direction even to the National Lymphedema Network, there are um, kind of uh, pen pails, uh, if you will, um, that you can talk to people online because there's no better understanding um, than somebody who's already been through this process. And so I, I do find that talking to another patient who has had primary lymphedema um, could be uh, a good way to kind of get everything off on the table and talk about how people react to you and what treatments you have had. And this is a great site for that. Um, of course, there are professionals um, who uh, you can talk to psychologists who are very understanding because this is a lifelong chronic problem and I'd have to say too that um, with the lymphedema population that we don't have a superstar to relate to uh, we have a very small voice I think breast cancer in and of itself is a very large voice but lymphedema patients don't have a very loud voice they have kind of a whisper um, and I think uh, we need more people who, you know, stars or whatever, who come out and say that they have lymphedema just so that we can bring it to the forefront. It is a, a kind of a poorly understood problem. When you have it, you understand it more, um, but I think we need a louder voice. I was told that I think we have to wrap things up, and I have been just... Uh, overjoyed and having to do this. Um, um, I hope you got something from this lecture um, and good evening and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you Kathy, a tremendous job on your part and we look forward to uh, a feedback from the, from the listeners today. Thank you and good evening. Okay. This concludes today's program on managing lymphedema. I want to thank you again for participating, and many thanks to Dr. Edge, Ms. Fassel, and Roswell Park Cancer Institute for making this web chat possible. As we mentioned earlier, this program will be available in our on-demand section here in the community so that can, you can view it again or share it with others who may benefit.